we have come to the final round of the debate, and each participant gets 10 minutes to give the conclusion and the last remarks. Uh, okay, Pastor Rudolph will go first. Thanks so much uh, for being here tonight. Uh, I know some of you drove pretty far to get here, but you know this is a discussion I hope will not end here. Um, hopefully there will be a lot more discussions that will take place as a result of this uh, in our own communities. Um, and let me just also say that you know, it is of cardinal importance for us in the world today to do this. Um, there are too many people on both sides of our respective um, theisms uh, that do not want to speak. They just want to fight. And hopefully tonight you'll understand that I, I still love this man. He's still my friend. I can really say that without any form of animosity. I can really say that I know next week, Uncle Harry, same time, we will <laughs> sit and have a lovely coffee together. Because our concern is, is that when you go home, that the fear and the boundaries that have been lifted up, that that will be broken down. So that is our intention. We heard a lot of things mentioned tonight, and we are to consider quite clearly, uh, two different perspectives. And I would agree, there are two different perspectives that have been mentioned specifically in the Quran and the Bible concerning uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, but we need to understand that these predicates are different. When we reflect upon the person of Jesus Christ as revealed in the Quran, we need to ask serious questions. Um, there's unfortunately a few books that I was supposed to receive from Muslim scholars that have been recently released where they write specifically uh, on Jesus in the Quran. And for me, when I look at Jesus in the Quran, I understand that Muslims have a, a reverence for him, a respect for him. But I, as a Christian, need to investigate and say, what does this person of Jesus tell me that is 600 years removed from the Bible and the biblical literature? Is it the same? Is it succinct? Does it agree? And like I said tonight, uh, I've tried to show, we all believe Jesus is a prophet. We all believe he was the Messiah. We believe he was a word from God. But here's a central difference. When we understand sort of from the Judeo-Christian perspective, there are not just a specific title inscribed to Jesus to just be something. But there's also a title and specific uh, sort of a title given to Jesus to do something. For instance, as the Son of God, he fulfills the promise to take the throne of his father David. As the messianic figure that was raised up, the purpose of the Messiah, according to the book of Isaiah, was to set men free from their sin and to pay on behalf of mankind for their sins. Well, how can God do that? Because God is both loving and just. And God would not be a just God if he does not punish sin. But Jesus comes, he stands in our stead as being our federal head. And what does he do? He fulfills on all the legal requirements and commandments on our behalf. What has Jesus become? It is so beautifully depicted in the New Testament. We can see quite clearly that Jesus becomes what is called the Manus Triplex Christi. John Calvin coined that and he said the following. He says, when we look at Jesus, Jesus has become the prophet, the prophet of our time. The author of Hebrews speaks in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 and 2. And he says, God spoke in days past through the prophets but now, finally, he has spoken through his son, Jesus Christ. That is something we are called upon. Secondly, what does it mean when we speak about the minus triplex Christi? It says that Jesus was also our priest. Uh, I've mentioned it earlier in my talk that, that we needed, on our behalf, we needed an intermediary between God and man. And Jesus became that man. And as God, he could touch heaven. And as man, he could touch earth and vindicate us of all sin. Paul obviously speaks of this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, where he speaks and announces quite clearly, or 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, where he announces quite clearly and succinctly that now we've got this mediator that is between God and man. Therefore, we can approach the throne of God, and we can come to God as sons and daughters of the Almighty. Now, let me just say this. Son and daughtership is something that is void in the Quran, because Allah can be the father to no one. And we're not saying we better and you less. All we are saying is that there are definite things that are mentioned within our books which differ completely. But lastly, 
when we look at Christ, he's also represented as our king. He's a soon coming king, but he's also a future king. And that is exactly what the author of the book of Revelation is trying to describe. We can see quite clearly that he describes Jesus as the viceroy of God. He becomes the king of all the earth. And like I said, as the king of the earth, we can see quite clearly in Hebrews chapter 1 that God takes Jesus. Okay, what does he do with Jesus? He, he takes his seat, his throne, and he gives it to Jesus. He says, you, and then God, God speaks to Jesus. And he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. God actually submits his throne to his son. And what does he do? He immediately turns to the angels and he requires for his angels to worship him. Let me say this, because we need to hear this. What we believe about Jesus is of grave importance. And both of us understand that we disagree. And both of us understand that one of us could be wrong. And therefore, we need to seek. Therefore, we need to go. And therefore, we need to find the answers to these things. Because when we look at Scripture, we can see quite clearly that the Bible describes, and it says the following, that Jesus did not come to lead the world in, into the light. He himself was the light to the world. There's a, a word that is ascribed to Allah, Al-Nur, in, in Surah 24, 35. That, and this is from John 8, verse 12. But also, the Bible testifies that Jesus testified to the truth. In fact, Jesus personifies the truth. In John 14, verse 6, he says, I am the truth. And what does it speak of? Let me say to you in the Quran, in chapter two, 22, verse 6, it speaks of him being al haq and Jesus says he is that Al-Haq. But he does not leave it there. He speaks of himself as being the eternal life. He himself is the living presence of God in the world. And we see that in John 6 verse 35. Even furthermore, he describes himself as being the eternal life to those who come to him. Now let me just say this. We know that in the Quran it speaks of Allah as al muhi in 7 158. But Jesus speaks quite clearly in John 17, verse 3, as him having that quality of life which resides in the Father. While the Quran says that the Injil, the gospel, was delivered to Jesus, and that's in Surah Al-Maidah 549, we can see that the Christian scriptures shows quite clearly that Jesus himself is the message of the good news, the gospel. In Islam, it is the message that came to Jesus in the Injil that counts. In the gospels, it is the messenger himself that is the revealed word of God. By attributing this title to Jesus being the word of God, the Quran goes against its own alternative declarations and sides with the Christian scriptures. And what we are saying is that when we look at God, when we look at Jesus Christ in his son, we say we worship God. We worship one that is in the Father. It is not a veneration of someone else but God. And we had a recent discussion, let me just say, on the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. And it's so complex. Uh, it would be wonderful to have a discussion surrounding that. Um, uh, one of my late friends, uh, Yusuf Baksan, who passed away this year, I'm very sad about that. Uh, we had a discussion on the, the biblical doctrine of the Trinity and Tawheed, which was an excellent discussion. You can go have a look on it uh, on YouTube uh, at this college. But let me say this. We need to talk about these things because when we look at the Word of God, when we understand what took place in the earliest Christian community, it is important for us to draw a clear line in the sand and to say, this is what we believe. You, he will tell you. Uh, he speaks to many Christians that cannot give an account for what they believe in. I speak to many Muslims that can't do the same. We need to be educated. We need to know what we believe and why we believe it. But even more importantly, the person of Jesus Christ will exhaust human logic when we look at him in Scripture. When we come to him in his word, we understand why the first hallmark which stamped the assembly of the Christians together was the worship of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25, we see that he was the presence of the living Lord in the midst of his own. According to Matthew chapter 18, verse 20 and 28, verse 20, all component parts of Christ deserves that worship and confession of his lordship. 
We are reminded that very early on in the Christian scriptures that Jesus is ascribed to be worshipped. We see different hymns in the earliest uh, sort of writings where odes and praises are given to the person of Jesus Christ and his saving work. We are reminded in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to 11, that he emptied himself, but now he stands in a place of eminence. And let me say this to you because this is important. What we believe about Jesus is foundational and it's important. It's my time up. Yes. Okay. I bless you. Have a good night. I can see uh, Mr. Ahmad is excited to come and close. <laughs> I'll call you. In a passing comment yesterday, Rudolf mentioned to me over a cup of tea that he's going to be accused of being too soft with me today, and you guys are going to feel that uh, he was just too soft. But I think he's given a, a good show and wasn't too soft at all, and I thank him for that. And any of you accuse him of being soft, I don't think that's the case, because it's not an easy thing to come up here and speak and to argue a point in a, in a, in a way without getting angry. And uh, we learn not to get angry in this apologetic thing. The only time you get angry, and this is for the, the, the audience and the apologists, please, don't go down the route of insulting each other's faith in order to promote your faith. Agreed? Thank you. Am I, Chairman, can I start? <clears throat> I think the crowd, you know, by <laughs> started off. <laughs> okay. فَلَمَّا حَسَّ عِيسَى مِنْهُمُ الْكُفْرَ قَالَ مِنْ أَنْصَارِ إِلَى اللَّهِ The Quran mentions that Jesus, the Christ, perceived that people are going to come into disbelief regarding himself. They might think that he is God or whatever, whatever, whatever. But Jesus perceived, according to the Quran, that people are going to make disbelief regarding himself, that they might take him to be a divine or they might take him to be greater than the Messiah and make him into God. So the Quran says that Jesus perceived that and he asked, Man ansari ilallah, who of you, my disciples, is going to help me in my way to, to God? Who is going to defend me? Who is going to protect my legacy? And from the disciples, some agreed. And from the house of Israel, some disbelieved. So if you look at the Unitarians in the world and different sources, you will find that the early Christian church did not believe that Jesus to be divine. And the early Christian church kept the laws of Moses. Like in Acts 19, 21, etc., James the Just kept the laws of Moses. James the Just, who is he? He's the half-brother of Jesus. And he had a certain ethos which would differ from modern-day Christianity in my apologetical world and other people's apologetical world. You don't have to accept it, right? but it is there. And then coming again to James the Just, let me just side note. If God Almighty was housed in a womb, right? James the Just, the brother of Jesus, was also home, housed in the same womb. So can God be housed in a womb and that same womb host another being who is not divine? For you to decide. As I mentioned earlier on, these five points which the Quran speaks about, that these five things are exclusive for God Almighty. And these five points, uh, these five qualities, have to be judged against any other being that claims divinity. And what are these five points? The Muslim scholars will know what it is. Inna Allah indahu al It is only God, it is only Allah, it is only the great Elohim. And you must remember when we say Allah, we are not referring to something else. Because... The Arabic Bible would also affirm that the word Allah is God. So in your Arabic Bible, you'll see the word Allah. So we're saying that the hour and the knowledge of the hour belongs solely, only to the knowledge of the great Elohim, to Allah. Number one. The time when the rains would come. It is only he who knows the weather patterns of the world till the, till the last day. And... It is only he that would know what is in the contents of a womb, whether the person would be a male or female, or whether he would be good or bad. Actually, when a person is in a womb, the Quran is a beautiful miracle of, uh, of fetal development. When the baby, when, when the baby, uh, when the fetus gets into a, 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 a dot and it comes into something hanging, a hanging leech, and then it gets transformed into uh, a piece of liver that's chewed, and then after four months, breath is in, 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 into it. And it goes on in our books that his status is known, whether he'll be a good person or evil person. That knowledge is exclusive for God. 
وما تدري نفس بأي أرض تموت nobody shall know the land in which he shall go and he shall die it is only God that knows the, has the knowledge of where a person shall die and 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 after that the last one comes uh, ah and only God knows what a human will earn tomorrow, what his livelihood will be tomorrow. So these are the five things which are exclusive to God. And when I compare this to the, the claim of divinity for Jesus, Jesus does not match because Jesus did not know the hour. He did not know or perceive fruit on a tree. According to when he was time for his crucifixion, he had to plea or, or make, uh, to tell God, take this cup away from me. He begged God. He wasn't get something for protection and it's your will. Well, it's some ambiguity or some I can read into that statement that Jesus could have been sure, could have not have been sure it was half-half. He did not know if he was going to die or didn't die. That knowledge is by God. What will you earn tomorrow? What, when, what, what? So those qualities, those five qualities, from the Islamic view, Muhammad doesn't have that, so Muhammad is not God. Jesus does not have it, so he's not God. So who is God? God is the God of the world who is, has knowledge of everything. And we don't want to go back and forth. We already spoke about Jesus and etc. But God is not a human being, basically. And <clears throat> let me get to the aspect of salvation. You see, we have some Muslims in the audience, right? Jesus says, believe in him that sent me and you shall have everlasting life. Is that there, Bible students? Is it there? Right? I want every Muslim, if you are Muslim, and if you believe in Jesus, who God sent, do you believe in him? Put up your hands if you believe. So I, as a Muslim, believe in him that sent Jesus. Clear cut, I believe it. I, it's part of my creed. So according to that verses, if you have to construe it or mix it up or harmonize it or jam it up, I've got, I'm saved because I believe in him that sent Jesus. Yes. So do not look at a Muslim and think, no, he's a Gentile. No, he's going, he's got no chance. You know, emotion, no, you, why don't you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? You've got no chance. You're going to eternal hell. Well, hold on. I, I believe in the, what Jesus' words were. Believe in him that sent me and I have everlasting life. That's one way of looking at it that we believe in. So don't just look at a Muslim. Honestly, don't look at a Muslim as some Gentile that has no scripture, no nothing. Hold on. We, might, we, have, we have a rich variety of, of, of information from the Quran, from the Hadith, from scholars. We have so many things to tell to you. And we look at it as it's a manifestation. And the fulfillment of prophecy where Jesus said, I have many things to tell you, but you cannot, hold it, you cannot uh, accept it now. And we look at it that whatever Muhammad taught, it is what Jesus would have also taught. And don't look at it that we are enemies of Jesus, because those that know, those Muslim scholars will tell you and agree and will explain to you something very beautiful, beautiful indeed. That when Jesus comes back to earth, he has a mission. We don't believe that Jesus comes and then it's already judgment. No, we still believe Jesus has a mission. He has few things to do. He will love, etc. And what I want to drive home, we believe that when he dies, he will be buried in Medina Munawara, next to the grave, next to the tomb of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Islamic prophet, we believe that when our Jesus Islamic version comes, or when Jesus comes, we believe that his grave would be side by side to Muhammad. So that can only show the amount of unity, the amount of love, the amount, the closeness between the two. And Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, peace be upon him, has mentioned in, a, in one of our traditions that I am the closest to, 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 to Isa, the son of Mary. All the prophets are, 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 are they are brothers from, from a separate uh, 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 mother. Basically what he's saying that the prophet of, of, from the children of Sarah is one side and the prophet of, of the children of, of Hajar on one side, but we are one. So this is the closeness, the loveness, and, and the, uh, the, the unity between the two. And we as Muslims, it's our duty to inform our Christian people what we feel, because this is what we believe. And let me just uh, recap. We believe Jesus is the Messiah. He's the great prophet of God. We do not vindicate that by worshiping him, you're going to get success and get uh, salvation. On the other hand, we need to warn you in a, in a beautiful way that ascribe not partners to God, no matter how great he was. Because the moment you ascribe a partner to God, that is the greatest sin that you're committing. And in Islam, we believe the mercy the kindness, the forgiving system of God is far beyond the need that the blood of Muhammad or the blood of Jesus or the blood of rams or bulls or cows or doves be shed for the salvation of anybody. God can forgive you without a drop of blood. God loves to forgive. 
God appreciates good deeds. Allah says in the Quran, ما يفعل الله بعذابكم إن شكرتم وأمنتم That if you are thankful and have a good heart and, and have faith, God has no reason to forgive you. So God has no reason to punish you. So don't look at it that no, you've got no chance to come to God and you only need the blood of a Savior to save you. No, you need faith in what Jesus taught, that believe in him that sent me and do good deeds. Don't think your good deeds are nothing and they are rags. No, by you coming here, it's a good deed. By you coming here, it shows that you have desire to know who the true God is. But it's your choice to judge who he is. Is he a man or is he not a man? Uh, that is the end of our discussion. And we give glory and thanks and praise to the one that is worth being, wor that is, that is worth being worthy of worship. And who is he? He is none other than the God of Ibrahim. I thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.